I can't take it. I want to enjoy singing related shows, I really do, but then I start thinking about you. It just, it ticks me off. I'll explain in this episode. Hey there, I'm Kim Snyder, professional singer, vocal coach, voice whisperer, and creator of The Voice Club Method. I've gone where no singer should ever have to go, and no other singing teacher ever has, to uncover the real truth about why almost everything you've been told about singing is just plain wrong. Would you take a minute and subscribe? It really, really makes a difference, and I appreciate it. Now let's get back to those singing TV shows. The number one question I ever get is, uh, what do you think about the singers so-and-so on X Factor, American Idol, America's Got Talent, etc.? And um, it's always a little disappointing to them, I think, when I tell them I don't watch. It's not that I don't want to watch. It's just that I can't. If you haven't seen or listened to my story, which is in episode one, um, this is really hard to explain. So (laughs) just go there. But because of my extremely unique vocal uh, situation slash education, I've been left with empathetic voice syndrome. Not an official name. Here's the deal. When, when a singer does something unhealthy or anything that keeps them from singing better, I don't just see it. I don't just hear it. I literally feel it. And it's not just that, but I watch those so-called, you know, specialty vocal coaches, and they're dumping more problems on these singers than they had when they got there. And to top it all off, it is so frustrating to know that those singers don't understand what's really happening to them and how it's going to impact the rest of their life as a singer. And in many cases, it ends their career. So uh, while it hurts me to watch those shows, I thought, you know, maybe a sitcom. I could enjoy a sitcom with my husband who watches the rest of that stuff, and, and I can unplug my coach brain, right? So I sat down for season one, episode one of Perfect Harmony, a lighthearted sitcom about a community choir. I thought this will be good. I wasn't going to do this episode. But I cannot not tell you Some of the things that you hear all the time that you really need to make sure your brain isn't soaking in because it really will make you a less effective singer. I've got a whole list from just one episode. Real quick, don't forget to subscribe if you're listening to this as a podcast or on YouTube. Trust me, you're going to want to hear where all this stuff goes. (laughs) All right, back to season one, episode one. Perfect Harmony. Tried really hard to shut off that inner coach, but in order to shut my mouth, to allow my husband to enjoy it, really. Because, believe it or not, I really do want to shut up a lot of the time. The only way I could do that was to sit there and write a list. I thought, I'll just write down the things I'm thinking. It will keep me from opening my mouth. He can laugh at the jokes. And then I will discard the list. Much to my surprise, the list got longer and longer and longer. And then I thought, how can I not tell you about this? You see, the thing is, Regardless of if you're an untrained singer or you've been studying the voice your entire life and have multiple master degrees, we are all a product of the information our brain has sucked in about singing. The problem is that the vast majority of that stuff has just been so disproven so long ago that it's just crazy to hang on to. And unfortunately now, and unfortunately it's gone on so long that it's still just being regurgitated at a very high level which makes us more confident that it's just us. We're just not maybe a singer. We're just not a talented singer. We can just do certain things, but we'll never get any better than that. These are what I call singing lies. Things that science, medical studies, vocal surgeons know for an absolute fact are not true. And I heard six big ones just in the first episode alone. So while I did enjoy the show, it's important for you to know what you were hearing if you watched it too. Now in the show, if you haven't seen it, it's about a guy who's lost his wife and he was uh, the choral director at Harvard or something. And and he's thinking about killing himself, but he gets a sign and there's this community choir that desperately needs his help. So he's going to redeem himself pretty much by leading this choir. So of course, this wonderful actor who's acted in tons of stuff, he's a phenomenal actor, has studied, you know, traditional, traditional classical vocal instruction, similar to what they would teach at like a university level because he's done his character research. And I have to say, he nailed it because everything out of his mouth was pretty much what people are paying sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn in an educational environment. 
And they accept it as absolute gospel because it's in the synopsis. It's in the book. People keep repeating it so many times. It must be true. So I'm going to go through the six things that he repeated, which are such common things that we hear in typical vocal education. And I'll tell you why they're wrong. Okay, just bear with me. I'm going to get it off my chest. And I think you're going to learn a couple things out of it. You'll have to let me know at the end, okay? First thing he said out of the gate when he starts to work with his choir is think of your voice as a ball of light and let it out. Which, if you're not a singer, sounds like, what the heck? What sort of mysticism is this? But if you've been around typical vocal education, you've probably heard this one. Things like, put it in the mask. Force the sound here or there. But I just want you to step outside of your singing brain if you've heard this one before. And I just want you to think of uh, going to a workout at a gym. You've got a new coach. You say, I want to build biceps, right? I'm going to go to the gym. And he says to you, think of your biceps as a ball of light and let it out. How do you do that? Now, there are a good many people that think they know how to do that as a singer. But I can tell you that uh, we could probably try to figure out how to sound like a cow and a kangaroo, although I'm not really sure how he sounds. But does it use your voice at its maximum potential? No. And does it make you a better singer? Definitively a no. So the next time you hear one of those statements that you're like, I don't, maybe I'm just not smart enough. I can't figure out how to do that. Chances are it's just not a smart thing to begin with. Number two thing I heard in this episode was, oh, Ah, you've all heard this one. Okay. Align your spine. Stand up straight. Now, don't bother sending me any hate mail because I don't bother to read it. But I will just tell you this. This is one of the biggest balls of nonsensical something that came from somewhere that we've made gospel in a singing environment that is just not true. I'm not going to go into it in this episode because... I got four more things to cover, but I will tell you this. I do have another episode that I'm going to be doing talking about the Easter that I discovered that both breath support and posture are absolute fallacies. So I'm going to go into depth on that one there. We'll skip to number three. This kind of goes along with the same thing. It's posture. Shoulders back. Again, why? Because it's posture, right? All I'm going to say is posture is great. Posture is great for a lot of things. Squeezing your butt, great. It's a gluteal exercise. But do you have to do it in order for your voice, your vocal anatomy, to do the absolute maximum it can do? Vocal surgeons who work on the anatomy will tell you absolutely not. They don't operate on your shoulder muscles when they want to fix your voice because nothing in the posture dictates how well you can sing. I know you don't want to believe me, some of you, and trust me, I just want you to know I believed it. For most of my life, I paid tens of thousands of dollars to believe it. And I was invested not just on a financial level, but just emotionally and mentally. I'd heard it my whole life. My mom was a classical vocal coach, right? I was at four years old being taught this stuff when we used to travel around and sing. So I wanted to believe it too. But you'll just have to go listen to the episode about posture and breast support. And we'll get into all of that. Number four. Oh, I love this one. Fire in the belly. Fire in the belly when you sing. This goes to the whole posture thing. It also goes to the breast support thing. And it also goes to how you stand and that somehow this middle of your body, this whole machine makes sound, which is just not anatomically true. Now, when I hear fire in the belly, I think indigestion. Um, And as somebody who suffers from really severe acid reflux, fire in the belly is not something I want when I sing. In fact, when I have fire in the belly, I usually take medication for it. So uh, fire in the belly, not helpful for singing. Number five, I've done actually several uh, different videos and episodes on this one. I'm sure we'll do another one. You're an alto. Things change when you get older, he says to a woman. Um, Okay. For those of you who believe you are an alto, a tenor, a contralto, a bass, a soprano, please go and listen to the episode on SATB because I go into all of that there. But let's just get to the second part of this comment. Things change as you get older. Now, this makes sense to us because if you're a singer, even just as you speak, as you get older, you notice that older people will start to speak differently. And usually women will start to sing lower And um, the voice can get wiggly. The vibrato can get wobbly. 
These are conditions that are a result of the vocal muscle getting lax. It's not because you have to be an alto. It's not because, quote, things change as you get older. It's because you're not keeping the muscle in shape. Just want you to know that as you get older, regardless of your age, this has been proven with uh, women all the way to 98 years old. With the right training, your vocal muscle can do the exact same thing that it did when you were in your 20s. So don't accept that you have to sing lower. Don't accept that if you sing higher, it has to be out of control and the vibrato has to be, whoa! You do not have to put up with that. You have to have the right training to fix it. And most people don't do that because they believe things change as you get older. It's not true. Number six was really funny because uh, it's a good example of stupid things we do without thinking about how stupid they are. He was telling them to go, Bottega, Bottega, Bottega. Uh, It's like a mouth lip exercise. uh, And usually they're tongue twisters. If you have all the way to Broadway level, a lot of times people will have to study with certain people that are really hooked into these lip trills and these uh, tongue twisters. And it's just going to, it's going to rev up the machine. It's going to get your mouth ready to sing because we know the mouth is involved in making words. It is. It is involved in making words. But when is the last time you had to do a tongue twister in order to give a speech? Singing uses the vocal anatomy. Sound comes out your mouth. So what you have to work is the vocal muscle that runs the vocal machine. If you want to warm up your lips and uh, learn batega, 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 it's kind of hard to say that more than four times. But if I practiced, I could get really good at it. It just wouldn't make me a better singer. Okay, now I should probably apologize if I've gotten a little strong and a little sarcastic in this episode. But like I said, like most of you, I have invested way too much time believing things that never helped me. And in the long run, set me back. And for a lot of singers I've worked with, have damaged them. Now, am I saying classical advice is damaging? I am not saying that. I'm saying it came from a great place and there's a whole lot of history that is really interesting that I'll go through in another time, but it really gives you a perspective of where we are now. Why are we not teaching what we know now? I'll tell you why. Because it's already in the books. It's in the synopsis. It's already in the universities. And if we keep going and changing it, what does that say about what we've told people for generations and generations? The fact is, when I originally put the voiceclub.com up, It was just as a resource for some singers I was working with, just so they could have some extra access whenever they wanted to to some information. The shocking thing was that I started getting contacts from people all over the world with sometimes multiple vocal degrees who were still at square one with the question, how do I sing better? In fact, our European managing director, Naomi Bignell, is one of them. She was actually teaching the classical method when we met, And she said what so many of them say, I've spent all this money, I've spent all these years, I wanted to understand my voice better, and I wanted to be able to sing better. I just wanted to know that it was a part of my body I could control. If I can control my weight, if I can control my diet, if I can control my health, why can't I control my voice? The answer is that the bulk of vocal education available, and I don't mean just classical, I mean the bulk of everything, is not based on what we know today in science. It's based on things that started as conjecture and theory and got passed along and passed along because there wasn't scientific evidence. The problem is we just became really married to it. And then by the time science came along, no one even looked. I'm not kidding. What is the weirdest advice you've ever gotten from a singing teacher? It could be something you read online. It could be something in a lesson. Probably the weirdest thing I heard was a singing teacher that said, Oh, honey, I I think you'll be fine as long as you don't ever want to be a singer. I don't think that's in the cards for you. What she didn't know is I had already been working professionally as a singer for like 10 years. And so I went, okay, I have a feeling we're not on the same page. Okay. I went to the next coach and they're like, there's nothing wrong. No problem. Why are you even here? And I realized, okay, we're not on the same page. Next one. And went one after another training this, training that. I spent my life looking for the answers because I already was a professional singer and it was in my best interest to learn to get better. It was an excuse to spend all that money. A lot of you are never going to spend the amount of time and money I did trying to find the answers. 
If you check out the rest of our episodes, you'll see that I really had to learn things a very uniquely difficult and hard way. And that's the reason I'm here to make sure you don't have to. You know what I'd love for you to do? Anytime you hear these, quote, singing things you think are gospel because you've heard them a lot, a lot, a lot, stop and question them. Say, A, is this possible? If I did this kind of thing in any other part of my body, does it make sense that that's the way the body works? Then say, why do I believe this? If the answer is because I've heard it and -and so-and-so said it and -and so-and-so repeated it and then so-and-so wrote it down, that is not a reason to do anything to the one and only voice you'll ever have in your life. That is no excuse because a bunch of people said so. That is not anything because a lot of people told me that their mothers and their grandmothers and their great grandfathers did it this way is not an answer. You get one voice and you are the only one who stands at the gate between all this junk that can keep you from singing great or even damage that voice permanently. I would so love it. If you would comment or reply with the craziest vocal advice you've ever heard that just sounded like, what? Or made you feel stupid. Because a lot of it makes us feel totally stupid so that we won't ask questions. And then we just think, well, I just must not know. They just must be smarter than me. They have lots of M's and D's and P's and H's after their name. So we don't ask. What makes you feel stupid? I can prove to you you're not. But chances are the vocal advice you've been hearing is... I just put together a really cool resource for you. It's 21 pages of mix. No, 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 I'm not going to teach you to mix. You've heard about mix, right? You know the word. If you don't know what it is and you're not doing it, you've heard of it, like everything else. It's called the Mega Mix Meltdown. Why the mix is not the fix that you think it is. Yeah, just like everything else, they made this complicated too. In this ebook, I go through the four original definitions of mix. Yes, there are four different ones, and they do four completely different things in your voice. Don't you want to know what you believe and why and what it's supposed to do and how you know if it's right and how you know if it's actually doing that? I'm trying to make that easier for you. And I put it all in the Mega Mix Meltdown, this ebook. I put it as a free gift to you when you sign up for our 2020 webinar wait list. We're going to be doing some great free training in 2020 uh, for beginning singers, advanced, like all the way to gigging singers. Those of you who are interested in or already are in choirs or all the way up to worship leaders, okay? Special stuff for you coming in 2020 to be at the front of the line to find out when and what and how and have a chance at our limited seats for those. Go to thevoiceclub.com slash waitlist. All one word, waitlist. And when you do, you'll get the Mega Mix Meltdown, Why the Mix is Not the Fix, as my free gift. Again, that's thevoiceclub.com slash waitlist for the webinar waitlist, and then you get that free gift. And always, shoot me your opinion. I really do love your input, so uh, respond, reply, however you want to. The reason I do this is not for me, not to build a studio, it's to serve you. I'm so glad you took the time to listen right now, and I really hope that going forward, even if you are 100% sold on the traditional method that you've learned to sing, I really hope just as an individual, you will start to really think about what you believe, why you believe it, and make sure that you have measurable proof that it is a real, physical, proven thing. Because when we put all of our hopes, all of our really ego, am I a singer? I don't know. Can I do A, B, C? Can I make a light bulb come out of my mouth? I must not be a singer. That's what happens. And when that happens, that robs you of the joy of singing. That is your right as a human being to be able to sing and enjoy it and do what you want with it. Don't rob yourself of that joy by believing the nonsense. If you appreciate me taking the time to uh, give you this information, I would so love it if you would subscribe to the podcast or the video, whatever format you're listening to. Real quick, I wanted to let you know that in 2020, I'm planning uh, some free training webinars just for you. It's going to be for beginning singers and all the way to gigging singers and um, those who want to be or are involved in choirs all the way to worship leaders. Everything in between. We're going to cover it in 2020. I'm working on that. But because of the software limitations, I'm only going to have a very few number of people in each of these webinars. So if you'd like to get a heads up, if you'd like to cut to the front of the line and know when the dates are set, 
All you have to do is go to thevoiceclub.com slash waitlist, all one word, waitlist. That will get you on the list. You will be the first to know when we establish dates for those free training webinars. And I have something very special I've been working on for you. When you join the waitlist at thevoiceclub.com slash waitlist, you're going to get to download a 21-page ebook I wrote for you on the mix. It's not what you think. I promise. It's called The Mega Mix Meltdown. Why the mix is not the fix. Curious? I hope so. You wouldn't believe how confusing we make this vocal education stuff. My mission is to simplify it for you. And I'm going to do that with mix in that free ebook that you can download when you join our webinar waitlist for 2020. Again, it's thevoiceclub.com slash waitlist. Get on it. I'm looking forward to dispelling some more myths for you next time. But right now, get out there and sing. <laughs>